we can start by appreciating what liabilities are. I'm sure most of us are already aware of this, but we are just building the discussion towards where we want to we want to end. So from the accounting equation, assets are always equal to capital and, and liabilities. So we contract liabilities to enable us to secure assets. So capital as we have it is the amount of resources supplied by the owner or what we call equity. Liabilities are the assets and paid for, supplied by other people other than the owner, what we call debt. And then assets should be the actual resources that are in the business that can provide future economic benefits. So at any point in time, the assets of a company will be equal to the capital plus whatever liabilities were used to secure those assets. To start any venture or company, the promoters will have to either provide funding themselves or look for funds elsewhere. That is from other available sources. Liabilities will come in the form of equity or debt. As the promoters go out to look for money, people who are contributing money will either want to have a stake in the business. Those will come as equity. While some will not want to have a stake, but they want to be paid plus interest, those will come as debt. There are times where you have a hybrid, what we call mezzanine financing or preference shares. With the mezzanine, it can be it can be a conversion from debt to equity or vice versa, depending on the requirements of whoever the lender, the lender is. So under equity, we have types like personal savings, retained earnings, family and friends, business angels, venture capitalists, corporate, private placement, public offerings. Under debt, we look at bank credits, suppliers credit, factoring, asset-based lenders, bonds, commercial paper, and leasing. And then as already mentioned, we have the mezzanine and the preferences for the hybrid type. So what is debt restructuring? We are looking at this versus refinancing. These are these are these are words that are mostly interchanged on the on the I mean inter, 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 interchanged within the financial sector. However, let us look at exactly what they are. Restructuring is reorganization of a debt or renegotiation of any of the terms and conditions that support that debt. Whilst refinancing is paying off an existing debt with, with, a, new, with, a, with a, new, a new debt. Therefore, refinancing is a subset of refinancing. Re, refinancing is a subset of restructuring. So every refinancing is a restructure, but not all restructures are refinancing. Once we are clearing off the entire position and building a new position from another angle, then it becomes refinancing. Otherwise, any other adjustment that we make to an existing facility is a restructure. So what will trigger a restructuring process? There are two main reasons that account for this. The first reason is liquidity challenges. There may be pressure to make debt service payment against other competing needs. Yes, I went for a loan. I have been able to generate the money for me to use to repay, but all of a sudden, other obligations pop up. So my liquidity becomes, the, 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 a constraint is built on my liquidity. The other side of liquidity challenges was also be delayed receivables. I went for a loan. I've executed what I wanted to execute. However, whoever is supposed to pay me has failed or has de delayed in paying me. So it isn't like I do not have the money, but there are delays within the activity schedule. So with liquidity challenges, you have a healthy but inefficient balance sheet. That means the balance sheet is healthy, but in terms of efficiency, it is not efficient because it is not able to churn out the liquidity that is, that is seen as the blood of the, of the, of the, of the company. The other one is solvency challenges. With solvency, you are actually eating into your equity or your personal contribution. And this actually arises when the company starts making losses or you start diverting 
money out of the entity. When that happens, the balance sheet becomes weak and assets become less than the liabilities. So why, why, why do we restructure? The main aim of restructuring, number one, is to create a breathing space for the borrower. I mean, the borrower will be able to spread out the repayments and reduce the obligation within the short, within the short run. So breathing space is created. There's also reducing debt obligation to sustainable, sustainable level. If I take a loan and I realize that all of a sudden I will not be able to meet up with the monthly amortized amount or monthly obligation, but I know I can raise money over a longer period, I can sit down with the bank and discuss with them for them to adjust it for me to pay over a longer period so that month on month I reduce the obligation on me. Number three is to tackle or get rid of a crisis situation. Nobody plans for crisis. Uh, we all have what we put aside to mitigate them. But for us to actually know that crisis will be, will, I mean, there will be crisis in a month's time or in three months' time, I don't think we, 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 we are, I mean, we do, we, 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 we do not plan for such. So when a crisis situation crops up, it is a good ground for a borrower to meet, a, sit down with a lender discuss the issue and then restructure the facility. We can also leverage on cheaper alternatives because refinancing is a subset of restructuring. You can refinance your position if you are, if you are enjoying, let's say, 25% per annum interest and somebody offers to give you a 15% and you look at it and you realize that the 15%, I mean, will make you better off. Yes, you can go for the, for the 15% so that you can also reduce the the burden on you. So what can we restructure? These are the aspects of the loan that are open for restructure. Number one, we can restructure the amounts. And in restructuring the amounts, we can either increase the amount or reduce the amount based on the dynamics on hand. We can also restructure the purpose. We can change or modify the purpose. I can take a loan uh, maybe a loan for a car and decide that instead of a car, I'm going to use it to complete my house. All I have to do is to get to the borrower, get to the bank, so that the purpose on paper will be changed because the purpose must fit the borrower's appetite. And then the repayment regime. We can also increase, reduce, ask for moratorium or capitalization or conditional payoff for the repayment regime. With the security, you can also dilute the security. You can concentrate concentrate it or you can swap or you can release a security interest rates can be increased reduced or changed from fixed to floating or floating to fixed future fees can be increased reduced removed or deferred and other conditions may 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 may, may provide you with more flexibility or you introduce a pari so where the bank is not able to give you additional funding, but your security is your 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 the, the the value of your security is way in excess of of the of the minimum requirements. So you want to bring in another lender, and the two lenders will share that security. You can also consider syndication, and you can also look at senior debt release. If I take a facility and that facility has been declared as a senior debt. I can go back to the bank based on whatever is happening at that point in time and get that particular clause changed. So restructuring can either be voluntary or involuntary. And this is determined by who initiates the process. If it is voluntary, it is initiated by the borrower to secure better terms and conditions. If it is involuntary, it means it is initiated by the lender, and this is to reduce credit risk or leverage on a borrower. A bank may have given you a loan, then the bank realizes that you have other businesses and they want to bring in those, they want to bring in those businesses too. Even though the bank was the one who initiated it, the borrower can tell the bank that, okay, if you want me to bring in my other businesses to you, then maybe because the amount is going to go up, reduce the interest rates or change the tenor or any other that can be considered under the restructuring conditions. 
So what do we consider before we restructure? Number one is the source. Is it voluntary or involuntary? Number two is the type. Is it a restructure or is it a refinance? Where we know that refinance is also a subset of restructure. Number three is the aspect. Which aspect of the facility are we restructuring? Is it the amount? Is it the purpose? Is it the repayment, security, interest rate, fees, or which particular aspect do we want to restructure? Number four will be available alternatives because there's a cost benefit to every decision that we take. You want to see whether you really need this or you would want to go the other, other, other route. So you just don't go to a bank for them to restructure your debt. If you have equity that can take over the debt and you're you'll be more comfortable with the equity, you have to consider that. And then last but not the least will be the financial implication where we, we look at the internal rate of return. If I'm going to restructure a facility, I must make sure that my internal rate of return is higher than the interest rate that I'm being offered. Then I can pay. Otherwise, what is happening is that I'll, I, I will be gradually moving my capital to the bank. We also look at the APR. The APR is the real cost that the borrower faces. And it's, it, it is a function of the fees, the interest rates, and the duration. So I'll look at my previous position, what was the APR? And I look at the current position, what is the APR? And then I consider which one is lower because that will be in favor of the borrower. Uh, it is not just about interest rates. Somebody may give you a loan and tell you that I'm giving you upfront fees of 5% and interest rate of 20%. Another will give you a loan and tell you that I'm giving you upfront fees of 1% and interest rate of 21%. You just cannot tell straight away which one is better. You, you have to put it into an APR formula for you to appreciate and look at the, the duration over which the loan is going to run. We also look at the debt service ratio. What is my capacity to pay? Will I be able to pay this amount comfortably over the period? And then we also look at debt to equity. I don't want to run a company which is highly leveraged, where everything that I have is just debt. So I want to make sure that even though it is in the bank's interest to ensure that they do not overfinance a company. From the perspective of being a responsible promoter of a company, I also have to ensure that I do not overfinance myself because excess debt is one of the reasons why some companies went defunct. So, what is the way forward? COVID is here, whether we like it or not. And with it comes change. Change is also here. The only way to handle change to our benefit will be for us to innovate. And we innovate to take advantages of opportunities to counter the threats that are posed by, by, the, by the change. So let's look at reasons why some companies fail. And there are so many reasons, but these were picked, these were picked from alux.com. 15 reasons why companies fail. Out of the 15 reasons, 11 of them, forming 73%, can be triggered by COVID directly. One, uh, one out of the 11 being lack of competitive advantage. COVID has currently thrown a lot of comp companies out of competitive advantage. Two is a lack of strategy. Some companies even have strategic plans for this year, which have been rendered useless by virtue of, of of COVID. So most companies are running without strategy now. Three is a poor understanding of customer needs. Because of COVID, customer needs have become dynamic. They have changed. I mean, there are places where you used to meet your customer. You can no longer meet the, the, customer, the customer there. Because of COVID, some people also now have wrong partners because nobody anticipated this. So let's say you start a business with a business as a partnership and the contribution was 50-50. Now COVID has brought in excess. Um, I mean, your expenditure has gone up and the partners are not able to fund as per their intended capitalization. It means you need to bring in an, an artificial partner, which is, which, is, which is the bank. So COVID has also thrown some businesses into the situation where we have lack of business acumen. Because business processes have changed, we do not do things the way we used to do them. 
uh, a clear example uh, 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 companies that are not IT inclined. Now, if you want to communicate with people, most communication is via is, is via is via is via Zoom and other online applications. If you do not have that acumen towards using those tools or facilities, what is going to happen is that you are going to be thrown out of out of business. There is also the possibility of lack of vision. Everybody had a vision, but what COVID has done is to change the position of the customer base or the market. And as soon as the market changes, your vision is also supposed to change along. So original visions that people had may 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 not work as we as we speak in a way that they would have wanted it to do. There's also the issue of possibility of not hiring the right people. Yes, now IT people have become champions in a, in a way. So if I had a company and I didn't have any 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 room for IT people, chances are I do not have the right people around me to help me to sail through this particular season. There's also issue of lack of capital, which may arise because of excess expenditure. So long as expenditure exceeds the profitability of the company, then you are eating into the capital of that particular company. We also have the possibility of not adapting quick enough. I mean, COVID didn't knock on, on anyone's doors. COVID just swept through, whether we liked it or, or not. Uh, as of the beginning of March, nobody knew that airline businesses were all going to shut down. I mean, nobody, nobody planned for that. But we still have to do business, so we still have to adapt. And the question is, how quickly will we be able to adapt? Another point is the inability to sell, which will have a bearing on cash flow. Once you are not able to sell, your cash flow will not come in as it is. And accounting will tell you that cash is king. I mean, no matter what you do, that is what is going to give you life. So if, if I am not able to sell because COVID has prevented customers from coming to me, then my business is on the way towards extension. And then COVID may also push us to do too many things at once. You realize that there are so many things you need to put in place in order for you to stay relevant. And if you don't take care, because these things are capital intensive, you may end up using every money that you have to put these things in place. And after that, even money to use to run your operations may not be, may not be available. So what is the way forward? Innovation is definitely the way forward. As before, as, as before mentioned. And the question is, how can we innovate and still stay relevant or still stay competitive? And the answer is to perform two activities to achieve a certain set of results. The first activity is to review your strategic plans. Whatever plans that any company had, I mean, most companies plan within the last quarter of the year for the, for the, for the ensuing year. So if we put in plans last quarter of last year, chances are we didn't even consider COVID. So we are supposed to, within the context of opportunities and threats, review our target markets, review our marketing tools, review our SOPs. In reviewing the SOPs, we look at our people, we look at our processes, we look at our system and tools, we look at our infrastructure, and then we look at the budget, and most importantly, the bottom line. In all this, we, we review them in the context of opportunities and threats. So for each of them, COVID is not all negative. There will be opportunities on some of them and for some types of companies. So you look at what opportunities you have, and then you look at, and then you look at the threats. And then in doing this, you answer these five questions. Number one, what changes are needed? Number two, how much will it cost? Number three, how do we finance the changes? How do we finance the changes in the sense that are we going to use equity? Um, are the promoters going to bring money together or we are going to go to a bank and ask for money? Number four, what is our scale of preference? Which one do we have to do first? Which one do we have to do second? And number five, when do we pay back? After answering these questions, we should be able to generate these results. We contextualize the risk that we face because each of these questions will pose certain risks to us. We identify this risk and then churn out or bring out the critical part of the risk. These are risks that you cannot do anything, anything about. There is no way that you can go around these risks. You will have to face them within a certain period, within your program. Number three is to assess and evaluate those risks. 
then you separate them into what is within and what is out of your, your control. And number four is to treat the risk. In treating the risk, you have four options. You either avoid the risk, you avoid a risk by deciding to do something that can counter that particular risk, or you choose a different pathway so that you don't meet that risk at all. Or you transfer the risk. You can transfer a risk by taking an insurance policy. You can also share the risk. You can share a risk by inviting more partners into the venture. You increase the number of the, the, the number of share of share of, of shareholders so that you do not bear the burden of your equity going down alone if that should happen. And the last one is to accept the risk. If you still want to stay relevant and there's nothing that you can do about that risk, then you don't have an option than to accept that risk and face it with all the consequences that it will come with. So a current case study, Air France, on the 18th of June this year, that's somewhere, somewhere last, 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 last week, Air France announced a 7 billion euro package that it has received from the government, from the French government in the form of a government loan guarantee to help it to raise, to raise, to raise, to raise debt. So let us try to apply the, the way forward or the innovation principles to what Air France plans to do. Number one, what changes or what changes do they want to bring on board? And mind you, Air France just they want to take things by chance. They are aware the airline industry is one of the hardest hits. Air France, Air France also, Air France also has a balance sheet of uh, something in excess of 30 billion euro, and they are going in for 7 billion. Someone may ask, why do you go in for this money at this time when flights are, 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 not, are, not, are not active? But these are people who want to face the change head, headlong. They do not want to take things by chance. So the first thing that they want to do is that there is a reconstruction plan that is supposed to put Air France on par with the best performing global airlines in terms of competitiveness. So you see, they are thinking about competition thinking about their market share, thinking about being relevant over this period. Number two is that they are looking at a swifter implementation of commitment to realizing the air transport sector's energy transition, which includes global resizing of domestic network, taking into account real network alternatives for trips less than 2.3 hours, uh, two, two, two hours, 30 minutes. They've realized that they are making losses, losses within this particular range. For flights that are not more than two and a half hours, they are making losses. So what they are doing is to partner with the real network to make sure that when they have such customers, the customers go by train. So they will make these trains more comfortable for them and let them feel like they are being given a first class service so that they can reduce their losses on this short, 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 short trip uh, flights. They are also investing in new generation aircraft to reduce carbon dioxide emission by 20 to 25%. So they are changing most of their luxury, luxury vessels that they have. Of course, they want to appear dynamic to customers. If the airline industry opens up now, customers will by all means look for planes that are a bit comfortable. And planes that, I mean, I mean the airlines can post of, 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 of some of these, these provisions. They also want to reduce passenger carbon dioxide emission by 50% by 2030. And they are to incorporate up to 2% of alternative sustainable fuel by 2025, supported by emergence of a French biofuel production sector. So France has started the, bio, the biofuel sector. They are building that sector up. And Air France wants to partner them. And by doing that, they will also be reducing, be reducing cost. And they want to increase destinations from 50 to 100 by mid of June this year. And, and other, 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 other commitments that, that, that they outlined. The question is, how much is all this going to cost? It's going to cost them 7 billion euro. And how are they going to finance it? It's a debt, debt via government loan guarantee. What is the scale of preference? They have various timelines. They don't want to do everything at the same time because remember, it is one of the reasons why companies fail. 
So it has been structured and they have timelines that they are following. And then when do they intend to pay back? Unfortunately, those details will not be part of the official communication. But without such a background, it wouldn't have been possible for them to be able to secure, secure that amount. <clears throat> so what can, we, what can we do? I mean, what can we do for, for ourselves? John, John, John Shedd once said that a ship, is, a ship in harbor is safe. <clears throat> but that is not what ships are made for. We all know that there are risks that COVID has presented to us, whether we like it or not. Once we want to be in business, we are going to be faced with, with, those, with, with, those, with, with those risks. We do not have to pack our ships at the harbor. Yes, it will be safe, but we will have to go out there because that is what we are, we are supposed to be doing. So what, what can we do? Number one is to determine how much we need to stay relevant. Number two is to consider our ownership structure. Some companies are going to be forced to consider horizontal measures. Some will do vertical measures, and some will even end up selling. I mean, unfortunately, that is the hard truth that we are going to be faced with. And we are going to look at whether we are going to consider debt or we are going to consider equity. But in doing all these things, we need to keep our customers in focus. Customers are like moving goalposts. Once the customer moves, the company will also have to move alongside. That move will require that companies undertake changes. Changes will require that companies go in for financing. Then we need to take a decision whether the financing is going to come as equity or is going to come as debt. If it's going to come as debt, then we need to consider the existing debts that we have. Are we going to restructure them or are we going to refinance them? But most importantly, whatever debt we decide to pick from a bank, it is the duty of these companies to also ensure that they have the capacity to be able to pay back. Because one of the reasons why companies fail is also mounting debts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. Your presentation has been excellent. Um, you use very um, simple and very pr practical um, terms. And I think even giving us those um, five questions that a business should ask itself before proceeding with the decision to restructure its debt or to refinance was sort of um, a, a, a really simple way of helping people who are not finance professionals to look at it. And I was especially happy with the practical case study that you gave with Air France. I would like to now open the floor for questions. Hi. So not, not a question. I think um, he's handled the topic very well. I have learned a lot. So this is Eric Ashiti. I work with Absa Bank, Ghana Limited. I'm in corporate. So I have learned a lot from this presentation. One thing that stayed with me was his, his final quotation by John Shedd that the ship in harbor is safe. But that's not what ships are built for. I think what, what I learned from that is that yes, we need to take risks uh, for gains. So nothing venture, nothing gain. Question of how we take this risk. And I recall the slide where he was listing some of the factors that lead to business failure sometimes over trading or growing too fast so yes risk must be taken but in a, in a managed way so honestly do like this 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 phrase or this quotation by john shed which summarizes the business we do as bankers taking risk but in a more calculated way so thank you patrick kito i've learned a lot from the presentation thank you very much thank you eric and um, patrick is there anything more you'd like to add as closing comments no, not, not from my end. Oh, okay. Um, they say brevity is the soul of wit. Okay, we have one question. Ah, it's a comment. It's a good presentation and it was clear. So, so um, I think that um, essentially that sums up the fact that um, you've done an excellent job and we're very grateful for your time. We know how busy you are and... We are very grateful that you made the time to put this together for us. And um, 
we're grateful to CBG also um, for um, allowing you to share your knowledge and experience with us. And um, that comment about it being a good presentation, that it was clear, was from Fatumata Gaku uh, from Bank of Africa. So, um, Patrick, your competitors are praising you. So that's a good thing as well. <laughs> we had a good comment. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. Yeah, from uh, Bank of Africa and then also from um, Africa Bank and everything. Um, I, I um, also really um, found your uh, presentation to be very useful. I did um, study banking, the law and practice of banking as an elective, and it's one of my regrets that I've never used it in practice. And so it was very refreshing to hear you um, go through your presentation. Um, we hope that we can come back to you or to CBG again um, if there are any um, issues that are bothering the minds of our members. And I would like to say thank you once again. And thank you to everyone for participating. Um, we have a virtual networking session tomorrow late afternoon. And I'm hoping that all of you will join us again. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And we are thank, you. Thank, you. thank you, Patrick. Thank you.